All right. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marvel Breakdown here on our YouTube page, youtube.com backslash Jerry Strauss. Thank you once again for joining us, and thank you for joining us specifically to talk about your favorite superstars, so to speak, your favorite uh, characters from the world of the MCU, the world of Marvel. Um, we're going to do it again. We're going to deep dive into one of your favorites this week, and we've got someone here with us who is a, a, an absolute uh, a, a big time get an expert in all things marvel and beyond in the sci-fi world so um you've heard her voice for a while on many many different projects many different things i remember hearing her first uh actually on uh, after buzz tv when uh, and, and this will date me a little bit but uh talking about one of my favorite shows that sadly is no longer with us uh, marvel's agents of shield um but you can catch her these days on podcasts like silver screams like no love lost podcast and the rooster team as well she is megan salinas megan you're here hi hey everybody how's it going going good going good um excited very excited to talk about this it's um you know it, it's a lot of fun to kind of dive into the mcu every one of these episodes all over again from the lens of talking about one specific new character's journey that we hadn't touched on before. So uh, this is going to be a big one. And of course we always leave it up to our, our guest co-host to pick the character for the episode. And uh, you chose a, a really rich character with a really rich story. Tell us who you chose and why. I picked uh, the MCU's rendition of Peter Parker, and I chose uh, I chose Spider Man specifically. Um, one because I've been a big Spider Man fan uh, pretty much my entire life. I fell in love with the character um, when the '90s television series was airing uh, when I was a kid. Like to the point where I actually wanted to be a photographer for a little while when I was a kid, because that's what Peter Parker did. Um, but the other reason why I picked this particular character was because, uh, I mean, not that long ago, we got treated to the trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home. And um, that went ahead and did something that my brain does every couple of years where looking at that trailer flipped the switch in my brain that goes, you're only going to think about Spider-Man <laughs> for the next three months. Uh, and so it flipped that switch and I said, okay, then <laughs> I'm going to revisit all the Spider-Man, every, every theatrical Spider-Man movie that it, there has ever been. Oh. Um, so I, I recently did a rewatch of the uh, Raimi movies and the amazing Spider-Man duology. Um, and I'm, yeah, so I, I rewatched those in preparation for No Way Home. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Well, that's going to give you a lot of interesting perspective as we talk about the MCU version of Spider-Man, which may, you know, spoiler alert, may uh, maybe more maybe those rewatches are going to be more helpful than uh, than anyone ever would imagined a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> it, it's just crazy to think about how much Spider-Man there has been for us over the last what two decades uh, on the big screen. And now here we are, but let's talk about sort of the introduction of just the Spider-Man character in any form in the MCU, because it's it, it's certainly a character that never could have been planned for specifically from the beginning, from the Iron Man and Incredible Hulk. You know, I'm sure that there was there was a hope that someday we could bring Spider-Man over, but I, I don't think anybody knew if I don't think anybody knew when. But finally, it happened um, in Captain America. Civil War was going to be the time was going to be the place. Um, what did you think about the initial I mean, we'll go back to Civil War now. What did you think about the timing um, and just the execution of bringing Spider-Man into that movie? Because that was one of those really packed movies. You know, many people call it basically an Avengers movie, even <laughs> though it was under the Captain America title. Do you think overall that that intro was done justice in, in that placement? Um, I mean, given the the context of the whole 
the whole issue between like who actually owns this character, who owns the rights to this character, who who is allowed to present this character on um, on the big screen, everything like that. I think given that particular context and knowing that we weren't necessarily going to get like another origin movie, I actually think that's OK um, because we had just come off of another reboot series, not yeah that long prior i mean it was it's definitely a messy situation you know going from um ending the uh the amazing spider-man duology it was a very messy situation ending that and then putting spider-man in the mcu i think for everything that was going on behind the scenes i think they executed it just about as well as it could possibly be executed um like, especially considering that audience had already seen two different theatrical origin stories for Peter Parker. Like, I definitely understand just kind of diving right in. Um, it definitely feels like it was a last minute decision because, uh, <laughs> you know, he he like Tony Stark appears, uh, you know, in this kid's life out of nowhere, kind yeah. of out of the blue. And then um, is like, hey, I have a proposition for you, even <laughs> though, and like, hey, teenager, let me put you directly in harm's way, even though the whole lesson I'm supposed to be learning in this movie is about how I need to be more responsible <laughs> about <Right>. my actions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, look, we know Tony Stark is a do as I say, not as I do kind of guy <laughs> in general. So that That's part I true. buy. Yeah. Well, and I, you can also definitely make the argument um, that Peter or like if when it comes to Tony Stark's arc specifically in the, the film Civil War, you could definitely make the argument that he took a shine to Peter and wanted to act as a mentor figure to him as a way of kind of making up for the fact that, um, you know, he learned at the beginning of the movie that you know, his actions in Sokovia resulted in the death of a young college kid who had, you know, his whole life ahead of him. And, um, you know, he's carrying a lot of guilt with that. I think maybe one of, that's one of the reasons why uh, Tony takes such a liking to Peter immediately, not only because he's brilliant, not only because he has these amazing abilities and he's doing his best to try to do the right thing. Um, but I also think it's partially guilt-based as well. Like he's yeah. he's looking to be a mentor um, for that, in, in that way, because he feels guilty about a, a young kid losing, you know, a, a young kid with a lot of potential losing his life, uh, like because of him. Yeah. And I know, I know this isn't an episode about Tony Stark. And I know no. that the story of Tony Stark is probably the most obvious one that we are obviously going to get to. And I, I truly believe it is genuinely just the coolest and greatest story crafted thus far in the MCU from start to finish. Um, I feel like Tony Stark, a big part of Tony Stark's journey is, is fueled by overcompensating for guilt. You know, he is just going all the way one way and then something happens and, Oh no, I got to be, entirely uh different do an entire 180 in my life and approach things differently he's just all over the place and this is an example of of like you said he's going to recruit this teenager um you know I, i'm sure you guys who are watching this uh are familiar with the plot of these movies and understand the stories we're talking about but you know j just to remind you this is uh you know, all about the Sokovia Accords. It's all about that kind of divide in the superheroes about whether they're supporting the signing of these accords or not. And it comes to a head here. Everyone's picking sides. Everyone's recruiting for their side. And this is a moment where Tony Stark is given, what, like 24 or 36 hours. General Ross says, hey, you've got like this small amount of time to go out there and get something done. And he uses this time to go <laughs> to New York and like chat with aunt may on the couch <laughs> and <laughs> and hang out in peter parker's uh bedroom and i mean to me that's the part where i kind of go mm, i don't know the clock is kind of ticking here and this is a very <laughs> you just you just sought after this kid that you found on youtube is that really your best use of time to to arm up to weaponize your team for this 
this massive super powered confrontation. Um, but again, I mean, you know, the unpredictability of when they were going to bring Spider-Man into the MCU, if now was the time and now was the place, um, you know, how, how do you complain about that <laughs> in the end? He had a pretty fantastic intro, um, like seeing him in the costume for the first time, like, you know, swooping in uh, <laughs> and grabbing Captain America's shield. It was a pretty cool introduction. Yeah. What did you think about the initial, um, just your initial impressions of Tom Holland in the role after, especially after being so familiar with the last two iterations of Spider-Man? Um, how did you think that he compared from the get go? Well, I want to preface this by saying I don't think any act, any of the actors who have played live action versions of Spider-Man, I don't think any of them are bad. I, I absolutely don't. I do not know where this strange narrative of like, you know, I, I guess people like have recently kind of come around to the Raimi movies because um, they're kind of feeling nostalgic for that era. Um, I don't like the narrative that that inherently makes the Andrew Garfield um, performance bad or uh, that it makes those movies bad. I, I don't really care for that, that take. Um, that being said, I, what I've liked about every actor who brings, who, who has played Spider-Man and who has played Peter Parker is that they bring something different to the role. Um, Toby Maguire, he brought this, um, you know, very soft spoken, very sensitive side to the character. Um, he, he really nailed the like nerdy kid, um, you know, kind the, the nerdy kid who who takes very much after his aunt and uncle in terms of their sensibilities and everything like that. Andrew Garfield really nailed the um the snarky, sarcastic um I like side of Spider-Man where he he does a lot of one-liners, but he also really nailed like how the the like rapid smart intellect as well like that you really do get the sense that he he is a genius and he has like kind of a little bit of the arrogance that comes with knowing that he's smart too yeah. and so i i really appreciated both of those performances for what they did when it comes to tom holland i feel like tom holland really brought a really fun balance to a kid you know, you know, you've know, got the spy side of Spider-Man where it's, it, it's a kid with a tremendous amount of power. And when he uses that power, he often really has fun using it, um, you know, beating the bad guys and getting able to say one-liners. But he also does a really good job of um, portraying a kid who is absolutely in over his head a lot right. of the time he doesn't even in just normal small stakes social circumstances he's in over his head <laughs> so i feel like tom holland really does bring an excellent performance as the the nerdy kid but also the incredibly powerful and charismatic superhero yeah, I, and I think a lot of people reacted immediately when when he debuted in the movie, just to the fact that you know even beyond the performance, he just looked and sounded younger than any of the Spider Mans before him. Like he sounded like, as you say, a kid. And I think um, I think it's overlooked a lot, just like the way he's he's written, you know, especially in Civil War and and in Homecoming. Um, like he just sounds like like a kid, like there's certain things he says. You know, I think back to even that initial conversation with Tony Stark, they're sitting in his bedroom and Tony asks him, you know, what gets him out of bed in the morning? Like why he's doing what he's doing. And he says, when, when the bad things happen and you don't do anything about it, they happen because of you. And I feel like even just the phrasing of the bad things, as opposed to when bad things happen, it's just very, I don't know. There's something very childlike about phrasing it that way. It sounds like something, you know, like why, where the wild things are. Like, it's just <laughs> like, uh, it's very unjaded. It's very just kind of wide eyed. And, you know, there's lots of, um, you know, even going into homecoming, like, whoa, this is awesome. Like, as you said, he's just sort of like wowed by everything going on around him. He's just um, really excited to be in the same room as a lot of these people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> she's like, wow, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> which which is funny because it's a lot of the same sort of tone that you also get from uh, from Scott Lang from <laughs> from Ant Man, even in Civil War in the same movie. So um, it it kind of highlights how childlike his character <laughs> is as well. Um, but well, I mean, yeah. they, they they make a point of it at the beginning of Homecoming. Like these are these are teenagers who have grown up with superheroes in their world. Like um, they that like the opening scene of Homecoming is um is uh, we get to see a picture that Liz drew of the Avengers, and it's it's super adorable because yeah, of course kids would idolize super these superheroes. Um, they we we idolize these superheroes in in the fact that they're not real. If they were real, oh my goodness, that like they they would absolutely be our heroes, you know that sort of thing. So. To have Iron Man, you know, somebody who has been a prominent figure who saved lots of people's lives um, ever since Peter Parker was, I don't know, what, eight? <laughs> I, I think that's uh, roughly the 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 time. I, I feel like roughly that's uh, how the time ends up. But yeah, ever since he was in elementary school, this guy has been like swooping in and saving people. Yeah. And to have him just appear right in front of you and say, hey, I like what you're doing. Uh, you want to come join my team? That yeah, that's that's got to be pretty mind blowing for that kid. I'm trying to remember. I feel like it was officially stated, and this is very much kind of retrofitting, but it was officially stated that, was it in Iron Man 3 where there's that shot of that child who's just standing there um, and Iron Man lands right in front of him? And like the thought now allegedly is that was a young Peter Parker. Um <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that quote unquote confirmed. Yeah. Uh, that's one of those things where it's like, I don't hate that if that is a retcon where where it's like that like people decided it after the fact that it was Peter Parker. I don't dislike it, but at the same time, I'm like, there's no way that like when they were making Iron Man three that they knew that that kid was going <laughs> to be mm -hmm. Peter Parker. I think it's a cute retcon, um, yeah. but uh, I I kind of roll my eyes a little. <laughs> it, it, but it is yeah. cute. It's very cute. They're good. They're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> They're, that like the way these movies are constructed is nothing short of impressive but come on guys they're not psychic <laughs> right right <laughs> uh, the, that being said though i mean before we leave civil war you know we kind of alluded to the fact that you know i mean it feels a little bit like shoehorning that intro into what the movie was intended to be but at the same time we get so much world building in the short amount of time that we see Peter Parker, both at his home and then in battle, et cetera. Everything from introducing us to Aunt May to even just, you know, his referencing of what he feels to be ancient pop culture that is actually not ancient for those of us who are, you know, beyond 16 you years that old. Super old movie, <laughs> The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> It oh, was man. almost enough to make him a villain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I will say, too, that um, it might have been a little shoehorned. But at the same time, you have to commend them for getting it done so quickly, one. And then, two, um, also having the, the very tall order of having to distinguish their Peter Parker and set him apart from the previous iterations that came before. And instead of allowing... Um, you know, Tom Holland to have an entire movie to do that as his first introduction in the MCU. Uh, they basically give him maybe 10 minutes to yeah. be like, okay, now you have to establish yourself as the new Spider-Man. Um, even though other actors who have gotten the, who have done this uh, previously uh, got entire movies and entire, you know, one person got a trilogy. Andrew Garfield you got two movies to define right. the character. You've got 10 minutes, maybe go. <laughs> Excellent team effort all around. I mean, it was, it was successful because I mean, it was, uh, it was well received and it just created that much more excitement for that official first movie. So job well done. Um, I feel like when you go into Homecoming and we talk about about that movie, it's a prime example of the fact that the MCU 
is in a place where they can really put a different stamp on a lot of their different films. And I know this wasn't a straight MCU. I mean, it wasn't a straight movie released by Marvel, but still very much part of the MCU. Um, but I feel like they they can do these movies that don't necessarily have to be all things to all people because everyone is going to see them anyway. So they were kind of free to basically make this like a John Hughes kind of movie, like on top of the superhero stuff. This is a story that treated, you know, whether Peter's date at the dance was going to work out with the seriousness of saving the universe. I mean, this was a teenager's point of view and it was just super cool and super different to have that at that stage of the MCU. Yeah. I, I really appreciated that, but it still very much felt like not only a Spider-Man movie, but uh, an MCU movie as well. Um, I've heard, uh, I've heard some complaints about, um, Homecoming for the people who really don't like the MCU's take on the character of Spider-Man. Um, I've heard some complaints and one, one complaint is that they feel like, um, Spider-Man himself is never really in any danger because Tony Stark will always be there to bail him out. Mm -hmm. Um, And another complaint I've heard is that like, ultimately what happens in homecoming isn't really a super high stakes situation um, because it's just Tony Stark's stuff is in danger. Like that, that sort of thing. I, I don't get me wrong. I respect anyone's opinion. And if, anybody's out there watched the MCU takes on Spider-Man and just wasn't their cup of tea. I totally respect that opinion. I disagree with the assessment though, that like, because Tony Stark exists within the MCU and acts as a mentor figure to Peter Parker. I don't agree with the fact that that automatically removes any and all stakes from the situation. Um, I like, I think, again, people have to kind of step back and remember, like, hey, this is specifically a different take on Spider-Man. I think people kind of get hung up on the fact that he didn't make his own suit. Um, You know, Tony Stark made him the suit. Like, he he didn't do this. He didn't do that. Um, We, like, Uncle Ben doesn't seem to be, like, uh, somebody that's even mentioned, like, at, at any point in time. And that one, actually, I do I do give a pass. I'm like, yeah, no, they should talk about Uncle Ben a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, I can understand why they don't, though, um, because Tony Stark is obviously filling that role, and um, movie-going audiences have already had to hear with great power comes great responsibility like a million different times in a million different ways. So yeah. I understand uh, stepping around the, the Uncle Ben stuff. Um, But I feel like just because Tony Stark exists doesn't mean that Peter Parker doesn't still have personal problems. I I feel like he definitely does. And that's something that's what makes Spider-Man super relatable is that he's not perfect. He is a teenager who makes mistakes and often has to deal with the consequences of them. And that is something that exists within the MCU takes on Spider-Man. So I, I think they do a good job of presenting him as this really likable teenager who's going through, as you said, these, this basically John Hughes movie. And, um, but also, having him be Spider-Man and having to struggle with like the, the responsibility that comes with that and having to struggle with um, balancing his identity, you know, with his personal life and his superhero life and uh, you know, struggling, trying to get the girl and struggling, (laughs) trying to keep up his grades and struggling just to try to be somewhere on time because he's being pulled in so many different directions. Like, I, I think they do a good job of presenting that. Um, but to to each their own. I, I understand if um, not everybody out there agrees with that take. Well, look, I mean, A, he was certainly in combat in life-threatening situations. So as far as stakes go, for him, still kind of high stakes. I mean, you know, now that we're in a place where we've seen Infinity War, we've seen Endgame, I mean, it's kind of hard not for other things to feel like they have lower stakes because we've seen that level of, of stakes. Um, but, and I mean, I'll go back to even my reference to, you know, old school 
Agents of, of S.H.I.E.L.D., the original iteration of that show before things went totally insane. I mean, it was more kind of, I don't want to say friendly neighborhood, but more on the ground, earthbound stuff that wasn't necessarily threatening the entire universe. And that was okay. I mean, even going back to the first Iron Man movie, I mean, certainly not the stakes that we would end up seeing again in the Avengers movies and such. So those first movies, those uh, not necessarily necessarily an origin story, but those first world building full length features, I mean, we got to start somewhere. (laughs) And it was, it was just a good way to continue to get to know everything about Peter, you know, his friend, um, we were introduced to school, to MJ, and just in general, that overall tone that these movies were going to have and the life that he leads. I don't know how you can complain about that. I thought it was a really good, it was a really good way to kind of just visit a piece of Peter Parker's world at that moment in time. And he had quite a journey from the beginning of that movie to the end, from the point where he's, you know, he thinks he's more than he is to the point where he's maybe earned the opportunity to be more than he is, but taking a step back to be mature enough to realize he's not quite ready for it. Yeah. And even within the the film itself at, at one point, um, you know, Tony Stark does take away the things that he's given him um, because he's like, you're, you're not handling this with the response. You're not the person that I thought you were. So I'm, I'm taking my stuff back basically. And that doesn't stop Peter from still trying to do the right thing. Like he, he dons his homemade costume and he just goes out and, um, and does it. And there's a moment where he is all alone underneath a pile of rubble Mm -hmm. and there's nobody there to to catch him when he falls. There's nobody there that's going to help get him out of this situation. So he has to do it himself. Um, so again, I, I understand where those complaints come from. But um, to say that the film doesn't address them, I think, is being a little dismissive. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, an overlying concept I also wanted to mention, and I, I, I can't believe this never occurred to me until literally I was putting together some notes to, for this conversation. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of, I guess, prior stories or different scenarios that we compare Peter Parker to and, and the Peter Parker, Tony Stark relationship to. It never occurred to me how karate kid this whole thing is like, <laughs> and, and, you know, going into Cobra Kai as weird as it sounds, there's a lot of different pieces of that story and this story that do connect as he kind of grows under this mentor that's going to kind of force him, not force him, but try to show him the way um, and lead to him kind of, again, finding himself and becoming his own man like Daniel did. And um, <laughs> I, I, you know, how you can't go wrong there. If, if your story mimics that of, of the great Karate Kid saga, then you're definitely doing something right. <laughs> Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with the the John Hughes comparison. Like, uh, Homecoming in particular is definitely trying to capture a certain eighties um, eighties sort of nostalgia uh, vibe. Um, so maybe the Karate Kid thing is intentional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, a lot of eighties spirit at least runs through that film. Um, you know, so where we leave Peter in that movie, of course, is he um, respectfully uh, declines the invitation for now to join the Avengers officially, um, looking to make his mark on a more local level first. Um, As a and, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. It's there great. You go. <laughs> and then the whole world goes to hell. Um, we get Infinity War, of course. We see uh, Peter you know, voluntary or not becomes involved in that whole situation because that whole situation comes to him and comes to the earth and he finds himself fighting in a a war, an interplanetary, a a galactic war, whatever you want to call it, that is far beyond his experience level, even at this point. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, this is a situation where it's time economy. You don't get to see a lot of really anybody in, (laughs) in a movie like Infinity War or Endgame. How did you feel about the 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 use of Peter here? Because I thought that for what he had going from one movie 
to end game, you know, quite the emotional punch. Yeah, I I think they used him honestly. Infinity War gets all of the props. Oh my goodness. Um for for pulling off the amazing balancing act of doing as much heavy lifting with all of its different characters as it does, having multiple on you know multiple concurrent storylines with such a huge ensemble cast is no easy feat. So I think they did a really good job handling pretty much all of the characters. Um but Peter in particular I feel like was utilized really really well. To the point where um, when he dies at the end, it is probably the biggest emotional gut punch of the entire movie. Or it's it's meant to be a huge emotional gut punch. And maybe it's it was just the biggest emotional gut punch for me because I love Spider-Man so much. <laughs> but um, maybe that was just that was just a me thing. Um, but yeah, it's- not in my theater. It was an everybody <laughs> thing <laughs> from what I could hear. OK. <laughs> um so yeah i i think it did a really good job of um you know this this was a very quickly escalating situation tony stark didn't want peter to go to space but then you know peter just decided that it was it was what he was going to do um because he didn't want to leave tony on his own uh and uh, I, I feel like the their back and forth in in the film was a lot of fun. I I really liked uh, the way that he and Doctor Strange played off off of each other, and the other members of the Guardians of the Galaxy too. It was short um, and all too brief, but I feel like we got a lot of mileage out of um, every frame that was there, and I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, and when he go, you know, he's one of many to be to be blipped out of existence, and you know. I, it's one of those things that I, you know, I've, I've talked with people about this before. It's such a weird moment because you see these characters fading into nothingness and, you know, you know, with your brain that it's, it's a foregone conclusion. There will be a, a day for them to return um, just from, you know, a branding perspective, if nothing else. But still, when you're in that moment, it's just done so well that you do you do feel that emotional gut punch for certain characters more than others. Spider-Man definitely at the top of the list. And I think again, that goes back to compliment the fact that we've, we've known this dude for 10 minutes in one movie, one full movie of his own, and then a brief period of time in this one. And already everybody just learned to care about him so much and to care about that relationship between he and Tony Stark so much. I mean, just expert, uh, impactful storytelling. Like, awesome. Yeah, and then them twisting the knife after the fact by saying, uh, by you know, it's not necessarily said within either film, but the the them coming out and saying after the fact that like, oh yeah, for Peter Parker was the only one who actually experienced pain when he died because of his spider sense. That was the whole uh, I don't feel so good bit, and I'm mm-hmm. like, that's so needlessly cruel <laughs> and 100 percent on brand for the type of luck that peter parker has <laughs> yeah definitely it was and, and and again you know it's it's part of the expert storytelling that you know and we've all for those of us who've seen Endgame in the theater, you know. For those of us who've watched like the the audience reaction videos that I still like to watch to this day, when everyone returns at the end of Endgame, you know that there was no more of an exciting moment in any of those movies than that moment when, among everyone else, we see Peter Parker show up again. And yeah. They hung yeah. That you know, we saw the shot of him. He got extra applause. Yes, <laughs> That's for definitely. sure. And, and extra attention, those those extra few seconds of just, you know, w- w- this is a moment to love. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, w- it was pretty, pretty bittersweet because what we're talking about is this ultimate mentor-student relationship that now they're back together because Peter's here. But that's not going to be for long either because Tony Stark is about to say goodbye. So that's a big part, a big piece of the puzzle in Peter Parker's story as well. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh it's rough. Um I think a lot of people were were happy that we didn't necessarily go through the Uncle Ben origin story again, but then uh to to still have him lose a mentor in um 
you know, in Tony Stark and have that sort of be uh, the version of it that we're getting on screen for the MCU. It's, yeah. it's very touching and it's, it's very, it's equal parts touching and upsetting <laughs> because um, you know, we didn't much like Peter, we weren't ready to say goodbye. Right. Never. I, I don't think we ever would have, would have been. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll, you know, I, and I want to make note of the fact that, there is still a lot of vagary with this specific version of Spider-Man's story because there has been allusions to, you know, emotional trauma in Aunt May's life, which I think people interpret as being the loss of her Ben, whatever, yeah. if, if that actually was a thing. Um, Uncle Ben was mentioned in What If uh, specifically which many people point to being like, okay, that's proof that he did exist in this timeline or, or this version, this universe, so to speak. I, you know, I'm still getting used to the whole multiverse thing and, and all the vernacular. But um, again, because now we're dealing the fast forward, now that we're dealing with a multiverse here, I don't know if that proof is in the pudding, so to speak. I'm not really sure, you know, I don't think it's been established yet how we know if what we're seeing is all in the same universe when compared to each other. Uh, mm. Do you have any feelings about that? Because you, you know, you have a much deeper background than I, I think in, in watching, you know, programs and movies and things that may have touched on this similar sort of situation, how it's been handled before. Do you think that we're supposed to know that everything we're seeing thus far is all in the same universe? Um, you're, you're, you're talking about in terms of Spider-Man's origin specifically in terms of like the, the, the plot beats of, um, losing uncle Ben with great power comes great responsibility becomes Spider-Man that, that just the that... exist, the existence of uncle Ben at all, because he's really only been mentioned by name in what if, mm -hmm. so the question is, and this is a bigger question that's going to become a more of a thing over the next few years. But the question is, how do we know that that mention of uncle Ben was in the same universe, that homecoming and that everything we've seen Spider-Man in before on the big screen takes place in, or whether it's actually a slightly different universe where uncle Ben exists. Well, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, that's the zombie universe, correct? I believe so. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily I think the idea with that particular universe is that the point of divergence was the um, existence of the zombie mm -hmm. of the zombie plague um, and that everything prior to that still matched up fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, you bring up a good point, though. It's entirely possible that um, exact details of Peter Parker's origin story could definitely vary from from universe to universe right. um and and i feel like we're probably gonna touch on that uh when uh when no way home comes out uh i nothing as far as i know nothing's been confirmed yet but i feel like we all know that that he's going to be seeing other versions of spider-man in that film um sure. That being said, I feel like part of the the vagueness might have come just from at least the the there are a couple different factors at play. One is that is Sony having the rights to so many different Spider-Man characters. It's entirely possible that the omission was intentional because of rights issues. And every time you deal with a character that Sony has the rights to that costs more money, I don't know. So it might've just been like a sort of economy of uh, <laughs> economy, economy based decision-making there. Um, but part of the other reason why I think there is this intentional vagueness with his, ultimately his origin story ultimately with his background is because most uh, at least in terms of where he entered into the mcu people were operating uh you know the people who made the film were operating off of the assumption that we already know who spider-man is we know his origin story we know why he does what he does um like i said the assumption is that we have heard with great power comes great responsibility a million times prior to seeing the movie. Um, so I think it's operating 
off of that sort of assumption. But that being said, you have to keep in mind, there are lots of kids who are watching these movies who, um, you know, the, the, when Spider-Man showed up in civil war, that was the first time they've ever seen Spider-Man on the big screen. Um, Mm -hmm. and it, it's one of those things where, I'm sure that that operating off of the assumption that the audience knows who Spider-Man is, what is the main reason behind that particular decision? But it's also entirely possible that they are just leaving space for themselves to fill in those gaps in an upcoming movie um, and and to provide that development and that context in a movie that hasn't come out yet. It, it, uh, Megan, it just occurred to me that there is a generation of kids and teens right now who are probably talking about that really old movie that was this old version of Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel that in my bones. Oh, man. Um, what I, I, I actually really like what Sam Raimi had to say about why so much care and effort went into his Spider-Man films in particular, or at least why it came from such a personal place to him. Um, He mentioned that, you know, the work is kind of already done for you when you're doing a superhero movie. Um, People, mostly kids, because these, these are a lot of times they're movies for kids. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, they have general broad appeal, but you're doing it primarily for kids. Um, and so what, what he says is that the work is already done. They already, Spider-Man is already their hero. He's already the, the coolest thing in the world to them. He's already, he's already amazing. So what you have to do is craft a, like, is craft a movie that is worthy of that admiration and that, like, and that hero worship essentially. And so I, I think it's very, I think it's very fitting that this is all sort of culminating in in you know a movie coming out later this year i think that it's very interesting it's all culminating in like what does it mean to be a hero and what does it mean to be spider-man we've had so many different takes on what this character is supposed to be um it's going to be very interesting seeing ultimately who peter parker decides he wants to be at the end of the or you know when the next movie comes out. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've heard it mentioned, I believe he's even mentioned in interviews, uh, speaking of Tom Holland, that this movie is kind of being treated as the end of a trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so definitely a big benchmark, uh, part of that story. Um, if not necessarily a finale, which hopefully, you know, we're going to see more Tom Holland going forward. But, um, you know, we haven't even mentioned the, the, fo- the last time, that we've seen uh, our version of Peter Parker, of course, in, in Far From Home. This, of course, the aftermath of being blipped away and coming back and losing his mentor. And now it's sort of how do you go on and how do you find yourself? And uh, it's interesting because instead of Tony now, he's got who we thought was Nick Fury kind of popping in to give him <laughs> some direction in a much less caring, much more forceful way. We've got <laughs> happy Hogan still floating around to guide him, but not necessarily uh, be there to support and help him in the same way that Tony was able to be. So it's really a situation where both mentally, emotionally, physically, like he has to come into his own and go to that next level in every way and kind of fight through his own naivete, if that's a, if if that's the correct terminology, um, to figure out you know what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right, and who's on his side, who's not, and how to stand on his own and and figure these things out. Um, but all I saw when I was thinking about it today, Karate Kid Three, <laughs> <laughs> he gets he gets stuck under the wrong mentor, figures it out comes back uh stronger than ever (laughs) yeah i i again i for for people who aren't fans of the mcu take on spider-man a lot of people point to this movie and talk about how like they don't think that like peter parker's portrayal of grief is is all that compelling um that they they don't think it's like realistic that he would go on this trip and that he he doesn't ever seem to have really any problems uh 
and that like the um the whole blip situation uh is played off kind of for laughs and that seems kind of tonally incongruous with how um you know with the emotional significance of it in in other movies and other MCU stuff uh and MCU properties across the board i i i again i understand that take and i and i 100 respect anybody who says that it is not for them i i get that but i i also think it's a a perfectly valid take to react to to react to something like that with a sense of humor um, and to, to try to reconcile with it through humor. And I also think it's, you know, people deal with grief in a number of different ways. Peter Parker wanting to get away for a little while and go on vacation to me doesn't seem out of character. I like people grieve differently and after losing a pretty big mentor figure, like I could understand wanting to take a step away from responsibility for a little bit to just mm -hmm. have a little fun, because that is the thing that Peter Parker is always wrestling with is wrestling his own personal happiness versus his sense of duty. And I so I, I think it it's perfectly fitting that he decides to set aside responsibility for a little while while he grieves and while he just tries to have a little fun with his friends and you know responsibility comes knocking if that means yeah <laughs> he, he's a teenager and and that's i mean not only is it it doesn't make sense for a teenager to want all those things and to want the kind of life i mean he's not like a you know 40 year old looking for that life of you know i, I have this deep seated need to have family and to have a you know whatever like a, a a house down the shore or something like that like he just wants like a girlfriend like he just <laughs> wants friends he wants i mean there's that part of him that has to feel unfulfilled if he doesn't have time to spend worrying about that if he doesn't pay any attention to any of that like there's got to be that pull that that uh that urge to kind of want those same things that everyone around him uh it lives for i mean that's what high school is so yeah i mean it totally makes sense and again like this is a movie these spider-man movies to me they're basically told from the point of view of the teenager like it's it's sort of that teenage lens like every every area of the mcu has its own different unique lens and yeah we've seen darker takes on the aftermath of the blip. I mean, we saw it in Endgame just how depressing and dark things got for a lot of different people. Now we're just able to see a different side of it. I, I don't know that fans would have been that thrilled to see like a dark Spider-Man movie where he's just somber and, and mourning the whole thing. Like nobody wanted that. <laughs> um, something, something else too. Um, I actually find him gravitating towards Quentin as kind of endearing because, again, he has lost that mentor figure. He, he's got like this hole in his heart. And so looking for it elsewhere um, mm. makes complete and total sense to me. I will say that I do think it's valid criticism to talk about Tony's plan in this movie, which was to give this super insanely <laughs> deadly, <laughs> uh, um, basically put putting this in the hands of uh, Peter Parker. We talked about this in, um, you know, when we were touching on uh, Civil War, why would you give this to a teenager, Tony? <laughs> uh, I 100% as feel like that criticism of the film is is completely valid because it seems like a very short-sighted and not smart decision on Tony Stark's part. I will say if we wanted to justify it a little bit though um that he trusts one he trusted that Peter was going to be able to come back that like this was that they would succeed in bringing Peter back uh, along with everybody else who got blipped away. No. Um, but also too, that he genuinely did think that um, Peter Parker was like, because of his intellect, because of his sense of duty, that Peter Parker was the right person to 
entrust this to this this it, you know this technology to yeah. and i on the one hand i get the the sentimentality behind that would have waited a couple years <laughs> personally uh it, it, i if I you want it's... to bestow it to peter i get that but like again maybe give it to somebody else in the interim <laughs> until peter can graduate at the very I, least i think also part of it is just the form that this technology took in these easily misplaceable glasses that i mean it, it may as well have been like a plot for the old Batman series or say by the bell or any, you know, just this wacky, like where the glasses go and no, they're Mr. Belding's wearing them and like blasting holes in his wall. Like, I mean, it, it, I guess in a way it's very much again in line with more of a, a simplistic kind of, you know, teen oriented kind of movie. Like it's, it's that kind of feel. And it almost seems like, almost an intentional if not a parody maybe a uh, a celebration of the simplicity of, <laughs> of that type of thing and but yeah high jinks ensue exactly. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've never seen like beach blanket bingo or whatever <laughs> our our parents and grandparents used to watch back in the 50s and 60s or whatever but i feel like that's kind of where we're at as far as just you know <laughs> very broad strokes that <laughs> these glasses that they're fighting for but yeah i mean i i think the the overarching thing is just the idea of peter learning to kind of live up to the expectations uh that tony stark had for him after you know, after the fact, just like in the first movie in Homecoming, he was able to live up to the standards that he had for him at that point. So it's it's really still Tony kind of coaching him up and guiding him to become a better version, a better hero um, than he was before, which is a really cool part of Tony's story, too, because, again, you know, from daddy issues to uh not having a lot of success necessarily being a father figure until the end of his life. Uh, but now showing that even after his life, he, he kind of worked it out. He kind of yeah. figured it out. He, he said it, he said it in homecoming. He's like, I don't want you to be me. I want you to be better. Yeah. And it, it does make sense that he, he would, he would trust somebody he thought, ultimately was going to become a better man than him it does make sense in some capacity that he would entrust that technology to to peter when you frame it in that context however he's still giving this very deadly technology to a teenager um yeah through <laughs> <laughs> through the use of some very silly silly glasses and that is definitely a bad idea <laughs> You know, we haven't even touched on, but we should mention it before we wrap up talking about this movie. MJ, you know, MJ is certainly somebody, you know, that character, the use of that character, probably some fans critical that it's a very different version of MJ than we've seen before. Um, yeah. I definitely, kind of after Homecoming, I definitely was getting dinner with a friend who was like, that's not my MJ. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you think about it though i i did think that it was a little bit again and hey this is high school and this is teenager te the teenage world anyway but it did seem like there was no tease of any interest from peter towards mj until we landed in in this movie um and then all of a sudden she was the one <laughs> I first of all I really like the way I I liked her presence a lot in in Homecoming. I thought she had great comedic timing. Um I I thought that her presence brought a really fun sensibility to all her scenes. I I really liked her her presence in that first film. Um yes, it does seem a little bit abrupt that um MJ being the one uh, is what Peter sort of instantly seems to gravitate towards um, at the beginning of the movie. I would argue, though, that like, I don't know, dying <laughs> makes you kind of reevaluate uh, what you want and, um, you know, what what your perspective is. So it's 
I wouldn't put it past him, uh, especially with like um, Liz moving away um, and him kind of like feeling partially responsible for that. But then MJ opening up to them at the end of the movie, uh, like to the point because you get the you get the sense that she doesn't really let a whole lot of people into her life. Right. Um, and so the fact that they open that she opened up to them, you know, I, I'm sure that allows Peter to sort of reevaluate some stuff. And and I would definitely say that, you know, <laughs> um, having been turned to dust um, <laughs> and having five years go by in the blink of an eye would definitely make you go, oh, hey, that girl that's kind of cute <laughs> that like I like who's really funny and, and everything like that. Maybe I should ask her out. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's actually great. And I just, I need to like jump on that <laughs> before like another apocalypse happens or something. <laughs> yeah. A hard reset perhaps. And your, and your uh, romantic list is, is definitely in order <laughs> when stuff like that happens. I mean, again, like you, you've said, you said multiple times, like these are teenagers. They're, their, their kids um mj is also a very pretty girl who regularly talks to peter <laughs> yeah <laughs> like as somebody who who clearly had a lot of difficulty doing that in the first film um it, yeah i could very easily see um him falling head over heels for her just just by the fact that she's willing to have conversations with him and he's just like oh my like I, I don't have to like <laughs> yeah. I don't have to jump through any hoops. I, I like this. She's just talking to me because she wants to. That's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, it's I so I, I could definitely see why like why it he would fall quickly in, in terms of like falling for her. It would be nice if we had gotten to see that. Like we're we're sitting here postulating what could have happened. It probably is a shortcoming that we have to do that, that we are left to connect the dots. I don't think personally it's a huge leap, and I certainly don't mind doing it. Um, I certainly don't mind putting you know, connecting dots between movies that, you know, where there's not screen time available. But it is a valid criticism of I think far from home more than homecoming like has more shortcomings than homecoming for sure and i definitely feel like that is a shortcoming and it would have been nice to see them develop their to, to see him develop feelings for her and because you could still develop their relationship in the movie in the in the same way that you yeah. do in the same way that they do um without him being like completely head over heels for her at the beginning of the movie but it is also 100% on brand for Peter Parker to be pining over a girl that he, he's not currently <laughs> dating. So again, I get it. It's fine. Look, we're here to break things down so granularly, and it's so hard to find things to complain about that I'm glad we finally found one. Because, <laughs> I mean, you know... Not he, enough MJ screen time is absolutely a complaint that I have for this trilogy, and I hope it's rectified <laughs> in the next film. Well, look, I mean, we've... Uh, for those of you who are checking out these episodes in order, not in order, you know, certainly in, in our Incredible Hulk episode, uh, you know, we kind of talked about the same thing. We talked about Bruce and we talked about Natasha and how that relationship just kind of appeared out of nowhere in Avengers Age of Ultron. And, you know, again, when you're kind of popping in and out of these characters lives and, you know, in reality, maybe it's a year or two uh, apart from when we're seeing them. uh you know, it's kind of hard to find time to tell all these stories gradually. Sometimes it just has to be shown to us and it's more like peeking through a window at a certain point in their lives. So stuff happens, but now that they're together and clearly are going to continue to be together, you know, going into the next film coming out uh, in December, um, it seems to work really well. I mean, I think people are enjoying the chemistry between them and they've just, they're established as sort of this it couple on and off the screen. And they're just, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm very interested in how the next movie is going to play out um, because it's, 
his relationship with other people that ultimately and wanting to to fix things for them and to to make you know basically it's him wanting to have i don't want to say have his cake and eat it too because that sounds overly selfish but um but yeah it's it's peter parker wanting to have a fulfilling personal life that is going to lead to some selfish decision making um that ultimately leads to the problem in the next movie uh and by problem i mean the multiverse shattering apart so, <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who are complaining about stakes uh i think i think you're going to be good for the next one like <laughs> oh i cannot wait for, for um Pete's sake. Oh man, I do. I like them together though. I think they make a very cute couple. And I think they've got, as, as you mentioned on and off screen, I think they have great chemistry. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, where their relationship goes in the next movie. And hopefully Peter doesn't screw it up too badly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those tentpole movies that everyone's so excited to see even maybe on a higher level. I think it's, it's, it's a truth. It's honest to say that I, I think this is a movie that's been anticipated on a higher level than even the extremely successful Shang-Chi, even more so than uh, the Eternals. Like this is one that we've been waiting for for a long time because we know the stakes. We know um, or at least are heavily the heavy rumors suggest just how big of a deal this movie is going to be. Uh, yeah. So, And and not to mention that. um I mean, that cliffhanger at the end, for a long time, that was the last Marvel anything that we yeah. got because of um, the delays that were caused uh, due to the global pandemic. Like, for, so for a long time, that cliffhanger was, was where we left things. That, that was the note that we ended on for over a year until WandaVision came out, mm. like, it, that's it's a hell of a place to leave this. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah, we're excited. So um I mean we have to go back now and look at this because this show is about that singular I mean, I almost look at this like a mixtape, right? Like we're looking at compiling just the the whole journey from movie to movie for or if there's a TV show involved of these characters and just you know, what the flow was like, how well the whole thing has ended up thus far, beginning, middle, and and obviously here continuing on. Uh, overall, what do you think about the MCU version of Peter Parker and uh, where he's been, where he's going, and how he's been handled from start to finish? Well, I think thus far he's been handled very well. Um, I It's kind of hard to make that assessment com like completely prior to the trilogy wrapping up um it's who knows with the the whole rights situation with sony it, it's entirely possible that this will be spider-man's last outing in the mcu kind of period because they don't necessarily want to keep going back and forth i don't know there's a lot of money <laughs> there's a lot of money there so who's to say for sure 100 percent either yeah. way um but it's certainly not going to be the last Spider-Man movie ever. Um, but it might be the last we see of him in the MCU for a while. Um, be, like, because uh, I know we've got Into the Spider-Verse coming out uh, next year as yeah. well, which super excited to to see that movie. That one's going to be such a gem. Uh, if it, if it's half as good as the first one, it's going to be amazing mm -hmm. uh, because the first one is a masterpiece. Um that being said, to get back to to Peter Parker and looking at his arc within the MCU, I think it's I I think it's been handled very well. I I like this portrayal of this kid who's in over his head, but ultimately has a good heart. Um, he clearly is seeking a like he he de definitely is like desperately seeking approval on like multiple different levels which is why he it's so easy for him to attach himself to various mentor figures um throughout the course of his films um but also still just at, at his core he is still peter parker he is still that kid who wants to do the right thing but also deeply wants to be happy and having to constantly struggle with those two things. Um, 
I still see that when I see this version of Peter Parker. I still see that very relatable kid having like going through that same struggle. And so I I appreciate what they're doing. I like the this I like Tom Holland's um, take on Peter's personality and the the way he presents himself. I I really like what the MCU version of the spy of Spider Man. And for the people who don't, it's perfectly fine not to. No, no, I, I mean this. It's perfectly fine not to because there are so many different versions of Spider Man. If if one isn't your cup of tea, there are plenty other takes and interpretations of this character. You know, that's again, that's one of the appeals of Into the Spider Verse is um, you don't like one Spider Man, you have a <laughs> plethora to pick from. So. Uh, if the MCU Spider-Man is not your cup of tea, that's okay. The Raimi films exist, and so do the Amazing Spider-Man duology. And if you are all about, you know, the other side of that coin is if you are all about the MCU version and no, like, no other version does him justice in your eyes, it's also okay to just, you know... It's okay for you to feel that way, but also maybe don't try to bring other people down who happen to like those take those interpretations <laughs> of the character better. Basically, there's no need to fight <laughs> Spider-Man. I think we can all agree Spider-Man is great. <laughs> Amazing. Spectacular. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Spider-Man uh, you know, is spectacular. And, and I agree with you. You know, I think he's again one of the better developed characters over the time that we've seen him in the MCU um and it's because of what you said you know there's still a lot of a lot of that duality that trying to find the right compromise between you know doing right for himself and doing right for the world but we have seen him evolve and mature and he seems a little bit older he seems a little bit more mature and sure of himself and confident in what he's doing but not too much just a a realistic amount you know based on the amount of time we've known him based on you know everything he's gone through um so it's kind of cool you know it's a journey i think that people can get on board for um you know <laughs> it's funny because the the end of, of these episodes are supposed to be us giving that homework assignment of, okay, guys, like you've heard us talk about this. If you want to really bone up on Spider-Man, here's what you have to do. You have to, you have to watch civil war, go back and watch homecoming, watch infinity war, watch end game, watch far from home. That's a lot right there, right in and of itself. But with the next movie coming up, you might have extra credit to do too, in the form of like five other movies that you might want to catch up on. <laughs> that's yeah that's assuming oh boy yeah you should definitely one if you have not watched into the spider-verse already you definitely should because just outside of this homework assignment it's a masterpiece go go and watch it um but yeah you should definitely check out the Raimi films and you should definitely check out the amazing spider-man films uh i don't necessarily think that this movie will be inaccessible to the people who haven't mm -hmm. um i i you know again like i said earlier um uh, you know these movies are definitely made with kids in mind um so you want to make sure your story is accessible enough for kids who are um you know who are only familiar with this iteration of the character that like they're going to be able to understand it yeah. that being said they know exactly what type of nostalgia vein they're tapping into. Um, and so I, I would highly recommend checking out those other films if you haven't already. And if you're like me and you already loved those movies, uh, particularly the Raimi trilogy, um, then you go back and you visit them regularly anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not it's not too big of a deal but um at yeah i i would highly recommend revisiting the Raimi trilogy it is um i found it very rewarding upon this most latest rewatch um and although getting all of those movies in prior to no way home coming out is it's a tall order but um if you can and you have the time i i would recommend doing it for sure 
Yeah, they're they're those really 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 old movies that came out uh, <laughs> some time ago, not that long ago. So you know, don't worry, they're not in black and white. Um. <laughs> Spider Man Two, that the Raimi, um, the Raimi Spider Man Two is actually to this date the only time I've ever gone to see a movie, and then immediately went to go see it again. <laughs> So I saw it twice in one day, and it's the wow. only time I've ever done that with a movie. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I went and saw it with my friends, and then my my older brother picked me up from the movies, and I asked him if he was going to a later showing, and he was like, no, my plans fell through, so I'll, I'll see it another time. And I was like, well, I'll go with you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, for the movie you just saw? And I was like, yes. <laughs> it was Spider-Man 2. All right. You know what? When we talked about how you chose Spider-Man personally for this episode, we should have led with that. That tells us everything we need to know. <laughs> That's awesome, though. What a day. <laughs> it was It was definitely a big day. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it, it's been a great day and a great time talking to you about this. This is going to be one of the big ones. And um, I can't think of anyone better to have spoken to to tackle such a big character. Um, with so many eyeballs and so many people's brains on this character. I mean, this is the, this is the superhero as far as buzz goes, certainly for the next few months and beyond. So thank you for, for more than doing this justice. Well, thank you for having me first and foremost, and thank you for letting me call dibs on Spidey. I'm sure there were lots of other people who wanted to talk about him. So I, I hope, I hope I did him justice. So Ben, and, and thank you so, so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, um, if you would like to check out Megan Salinas, she is uh, on a virtual plethora of different podcasts, including Silver Screens. Uh, no love lost and the rooster team. And how about Twitter? Do we want people to still follow you at the Menguin? Yeah, you guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the Menguin. That's T H E M E N G U I N. Um, and you can follow all of those shows on their respective social medias. That's at silver underscore screams, um, and at no love lost pod and at the rooster team. Awesome. Awesome. And for those of you who have not done so yet, if you want to check out more videos like this, more interviews, even outside of the Marvel universe with your favorites from TV, um, comedy and more subscribe youtube.com backslash Jerry Strauss. You can do it right down there somewhere. I think, um, click away. It's free. It's easy. And, uh, I thank you for it. And, uh, Megan, thank you so much again for being on the show. We'll see everyone next time on Marvel breakdown.